Um, so, folks, um, it's uh, we have a good good crowd on tonight. So, this is the first part of the um, our, our specialist series for for our development squad. Um, lads, so everybody's um, everybody's under 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 twenty one at the minute, been seventeen and twenty one. So, it's just about you know giving different elements of of uh, of performance with about psychology, nutrition, um, and just listen to some experts. Um, let the lads throw in a few questions they have, and hopefully they'll gain one or two things um, out of the session. So um, we'll, we'll get started. Um, Mara Trasset, um, thanks a million for jumping on the, on the call with us to, today. Um, lads, some of you probably know more from, you know, air sports, news talk, um, off the ball. She does a lot of GA coverage um, um, with, with, those, um, with those guys, and she's also an, uh, an accredited sports psychologist. Um, so recently she was involved with, um, you know, Galway footballers. Um, what you're saying, you're, you're doing, they're dealing with a lot of teams in Dublin over this year as well as um Roscommon ladies. So it's 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 brilliant to get an, an insight from from someone of your um your expertise to just maybe the lads can um you know, they send in a few questions and hopefully they'll take one or two things away with their with their own game. Um so yeah more. hi everyone um, I'm not sure I call myself an expert but um sure I'll do my best and we'll see how we go but feel free to fire in any questions and just remember that um because I don't know you guys individually anything will be quite quite generalized and stuff but sure I'll, I'll do my best and hopefully you guys will take something from it even if you want to take one thing hopefully it'll be worth it perfect perfect so the first question we're sent down there and more was just what what would be involved um uh in your role as a sports psychologist with an adult team Um, back. Back, Mickey, there we go. You, um, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. You just disappeared there for a second. Sorry, I'll say <laughs> uh, I've just changed my I changed the wife editor again there. So um the first question sent in there more is um what what would be involved um with your role as a sports psychologist with, with an adult team? Oh, um, that is one of the questions that um, is difficult to answer um, without going down a rabbit hole, um, without giving too much away and at the same time giving a little bit of information. So first thing involved is confidentiality. Um, you don't talk outside the camp. Um, any messages that are coming from you from outside the camp are agreed with the team in advance. Um, and the main thing is, though, in general, it doesn't matter who I'm working with, if the team is elite or amateur, male, female, junior, intermediate, senior, rugby, football, Gaelic, whatever, basketball. Um, it doesn't matter. My job as a sports psychologist is to kind of be a liaison between management and players to make sure everybody's understanding each other and communicating in the right way, allowing safe communication, giving people tips and tricks. And that includes managers as well, by the way, but helping to deal with stressors, pressure points, how to get the best out of themselves. But most importantly, my philosophy is that you should be enjoying your sport and if you're not enjoying your sport that you should be able to talk to me and we'll find ways to help you I mean no you're, is anybody going to enjoy those murder runs all the time hell no but in general you should be leaving glad that you're involved and glad that you're a part of it, it doesn't feel like a drudge if it does something's gone wrong somewhere I'm one of those pesky sports psychologists who believes in your well-being and if you're feeling good and if your well-being is in a good place your performance will go there are some people who go aim for performance but I find that what's going to happen is your well-being is going to come down like this. And what I try and do is have well-being here and then performance will come up to meet it. It might take a bit longer, but you'll be a better sports player as a result. And that's my philosophy. And I think if you're not feeling good, you might be performing well in the field, but it won't last. And even if you are performing well, you're not performing as good as you could be. So, yeah, it's a mixture of little things. Sometimes it can be as simple as making sure everybody's organized and having a chat with people and with some people can be as simple as ensuring they've packed their bag properly, you know, simple things like that. Some people might really struggle getting organized to get out on time and it's helping them give those strategies. It's recognizing different pressure points, different helps. Like not everybody needs help with anxiety management, you know, so why would you waste everyone's time talking about it? But it's identifying and going through baselines. I would do a lot of psychometric testing mm -hmm. and then identify, say, you know, oh, maybe Michael needs more help with his sleep. I'm going to talk to him and see why he isn't sleeping so well, you know, so it's varied. And, um, and it depends too on the type of manager you have and if they allow you to take that kind of role. Some managers don't want you to, some managers don't have the resources, some want you to do it all. So it's all dependent on the team and the personalities involved. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I, oh, we have a few more just jumping on the call as well. 
Um, more, a next question sent by one of the lads was, um, if you're having a bad game, for example, um, you know, a bad first half, what, what can you say to yourself or is there any strategies to, to, you know, to make sure you perform better in, in the second half? Um, one of the best ways to help you get out of a funk if you're in a game is to know that you've done the work already. Now, this doesn't work if you haven't really shown up for training or when you show up for training, you're hiding behind the good players or you're hiding behind the lad, you know, who's killing himself all the time. So you can always give kind of a six or a seven out of 10 at training. If you give a six or a seven out of 10 at training, why would you expect that the match day scenario then is going to be 10 out of 10? But if you are giving 10 out of 10 at your training session, if you're working as hard as you can in training, you know, in a match scenario, that you've done the work. And a lot of the time, that's what plays on your mind. You know, it's like, because all of a sudden your insecurities about yourself, they're going to start coming to the fore. So what happens is if you're having a bad game and if you know you haven't done the work, that little voice starts getting louder and louder. So I'm like, oh, look, at this is all those training sessions that you didn't do properly. You knew you were, he wasn't looking. You knew you were getting away with the baseline figures, that kind of thing. So the first thing I would tell you is you have to get your homework done in advance. If you find things are still not going your way, even though you feel you've done everything right and for some reason the game just isn't working for you, which happens to everyone, sometimes the worst happens and you're taken off or you're the person you're marking manages to get away and score a goal, which is a nightmare scenario for anyone if you're feeling bad about yourself to begin with. And sometimes you have to accept that's just the way it's gone and take your punishment when you're taken off and look back and analyze it and know that that's what happened and know that won't happen again because you've analyzed it properly instead of looking at it going oh god that was a basket case of a decision what you're going to do is look at it and understand why things happen and what you're going to do to ensure it doesn't happen again so you know you 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 win or you learn but as well as that if you're on the field and you need to control that delete moment and that's how i describe it as a bit like when mickey's freezing here on the on the zoom with us what do you do you don't panic You don't throw the laptop out the window. That's not going to help things. He's still going to be frozen at the end of it. You find a strategy that works to come back from it. For some people, it's mentally saying in their head, cop on, stop. For others, it's doing a bit of deep breathing. For others, it's doing a bit of movement. For others, it's just recognizing that trigger. And that's where it's very important to be comfortable in your own skin and your own mind and know what you're thinking. Know when you start going down the problematic patterns of thinking, if that makes sense. And that's where it's really important to work with a sports psych that you can sometimes talk to them. And it might take a session or two for you to figure out, aha, that incident is my trigger or that feeling is my trigger. And then once you identify the trigger, then you work with somebody to identify the way to come back from the trigger, you know? So it's very individualized, but generally the answer I give to this question, and obviously it's a common question because it happens to everyone, not just in sport, you know, you're going in an interview or something and all of a sudden you realize you're answering the question for that job you really want. And you're halfway down the garden path answering it and you've forgotten the question you were asked. You're thinking, oh, good God, how do I reverse out of this? And sometimes that's what I mean. It's recognizing your trigger. And the earlier you manage to do that, the earlier in your sporting career that you know your trigger, the better you are at dealing with it when it happens. So if you don't do that work to find your trigger before the big game, say, and what's going to happen then is you're going to recognize it later. and probably too late. You'll be on the bench when you realize it. So it's about recognizing your emotions understanding your feelings knowing that it's normal but being quick enough to know why it's happening how it's happening and what you can do to turn it back and that's different for everyone so like i said it can be talking to yourself deep breathing recognizing the feelings in your stomach stamping your feet doing a little twirl whatever it helps you shake off that feeling like i always tell the story i know of one intercounty hurler who literally will sing the taylor swift song shake it off in his head when he feels that way and i sometimes see him do this and that's his trigger and it works that's not going to work for everyone. You may feel like you're a crazy lunatic by doing that, but for him it works. So that's the secret. It's finding what works for you. Right, more that's that's a top class. And, and lads, if you do have your, your phone handy or, or a pen and paper, like don't be afraid to take a few notes and just even even reflect on your on your on your own um on your own routines and your own ways of thinking. Um, more you've sort of already we've already answered it, but the the second part of that was you know if if lads have um you know, big game coming up and and they they don't deal well with nerves or anxiety is there any um you know root, certain routines or, or strategies that can that can help um you know get the best from those nerves yeah i would say first of all if you're lucky enough to have a team that has a service of a, of a sports psychologist for god's sake pick up the phone and ring them that's our job 
Um, you'd be amazed the amount of people who come to us after the disaster has happened and then we can't do anything to help whereas pre the game we might be able to do something for you if you don't have a sports psych find a coach that you can talk to or a manager if you feel that they're not going to be conducive because let's call a spade a spade not every manager is open in these scenarios and some to this day I hate to say it there are still some who are quite old school who would see if you come to them saying geez I'm feeling a bit anxious or nervous who will see it as a sign of weakness if your coach has fallen into that bracket, remember one, they are wrong, <laughs> but you can't help that. And two, there are going to be teammates who've been in the same boat as you. Find them and talk to them. Guarantee there's going to be somebody older or more experienced who's had those issues. Um, find ways that you think you're good to help you manage stress control. Stressful situations outside of sport. You've had them at some point, be it in school, could be reading out loud, being forced to read at mass, asking somebody out, all those things. Think about how you've dealt with them. Think if your coping mechanisms are healthy. Does it involve breathing? Have you ever tried meditating? I tried. It took me a long time to get into getting into meditating. I hated it. It bored me to tears. But it was because I didn't allow my mind to relax. the window you're going to fight or flight which is why your stomach starts doing 90 which is why probably a lot of people on this call who may be the day of a big game or if you're nervous you're going to the toilet more often than somebody who's taking laxatives or you can't eat or you're eating loads or whatever it's fight or flight your heart starts going 90 and what you're trying to do is slow those symptoms down once you slow them down your brain is tricked into feeling that he or she is relaxed so the easiest way to slow things down is breathing I think deep breathing is excellent. It's used in cognitive behavioral therapy for people who like, say, for example, have a fear of flying. So if you have a fear, I've poor Aidan O'Shea there in front of me. So if your fear is Mayo for whatever reason, let's say, for example, uh, you just need to visualize in your head what that fear is that you're having right now. What, caught, what brings you that fear or feeling of stress? Ask yourself, where in your body are you feeling that fear or stress? So say, for example, if you're feeling it in your stomach, imagine it as a, as as you're breathing deeply in and letting the breath out with each out breath, that fear in the stomach is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it's gone. That will take a long time the first time you do it and it gets quicker with everything. And again, that's why it's important. It's grounding, it's settling yourself. And it might sound airy fairy, there's enough science behind it. You don't need pills, you don't need magic potions, you don't need to go talk to a guru. You just need to find your own ways to settle your system to get the best out of yourself. That's perfect. That's that's, that's, really, that's that's really useful, Amor. And I know we have a few few coaches on um um from each squad as well on on the call too. So it's 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 even even better that they're listening on as well. Um, the the next question there, more is um sort of a few more coming in. Um, is there any elements of sports psychology that can apply to to life in general that you find over the years? Um. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. One, we have, as I just said there a few minutes ago, we have anxious and pressurized moment mm -hmm. everywhere in life and um, it's outside when you're applying for college applying for jobs asking people out having to be a bit assertive you know when somebody's kind of stepped on your toes and you know you're right and you need to stand up for yourself and that doesn't come naturally to all of us and um, those kind of skills uh, the skills for team management as well in the corporate world like how many of us might go on to have careers already in careers in law firms accountancy building sites somebody has to manage people it's a great background for hr or anyone who's involved in any kind of people skills this is why for example you see people who've been in the army for example or people involved in sport in particular you know they're a high commodity for employers because they know you're coming in with these skills of resilience they know you're coming in with experience of setting your goals they know you're coming in or you should be organized they know you're capable of I suppose, focusing on certain things to achieve certain targets and they know you're capable of hard work and commitment and focus and drive. And um, so why not use sports psychology to get the best out of yourself, to get that last half inch? Every one of us can show up to training, but I often say it's the people who are really dedicated who dedicate maybe an extra few minutes a day to the development of their brain and their mind, which not everybody does. And that often is the difference. Like when people say, you know, we'll use the, maybe the Dublin Mayo rivalry of recent years in the All-Ireland Finals, you could argue were Mayo overperforming for a lot of that. You could say, yes, are they a great football team? Yes. Did they the difference between them and Dublin was let's call a spade a spade? One was Dublin probably had a better bench than Mayo had a lot of the time. But 15 on 15, Mayo were able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And that was because they were so conditioned in their heads 
that they were able to keep up with Dublin compared to so many teams who go out and are beaten before they even start against Dublin. Mayo are never beaten before they go out and play Dublin. Ironically, the poor things, they end up on the wrong side of it. But they never fear Dublin. Mm. And a lot of that is because they have these resilient skills built up. Like the advantage of not winning all the time means you're battle hardened. It means you're resilient. It means you know what failure is. It means you know how to avoid failure. It means that um, you probably do get more out of yourself than the person who's never been challenged. And employers know this, colleges know this. Um, it's just good for you as well. You'll find that if you're able to balance these things properly, life is a bit easier for you. Or if it's not easier, it's because you've taken on more than the average person, which means you're still functioning at a higher level than most people. That's pretty cool. I, I like I like I like that example too about the you know the Dublin. I think that perfectly sums it up. Um, more we're we're into the last few questions that the lads submitted, um, and you've sort of nearly hit hit um hit the next one as as you as you go along. But um, um, is there anything um you would encourage on under twenty ones to do um more from a sports psychologist um point of view? I know my internet's shaky, sorry, but you've already touched on a few things. Is there anything else you'd like yeah. to take to add? Okay. Can you repeat that question? Because I miss. Oh, there we go. It's up on the screen now. I can see oh. it. Under twenty ones to do more from a sports psychology point of view. Yeah, one give it time. And um, people say, "Oh, I don't want to be reading books about psychology." Don't bother with the flipping books. Don't do any of that stuff. For a start, go to my Instagram page for an example, or other sports psychologists. Those of us who put up little bites, they are small little bite-sized things. And if you just give five minutes of your day to that, I can guarantee you, you are doing more for your head from a psychological point of view than most athletes out there, elite or amateur, because people just don't give it the time because it's not being put into their structure unless they have a forward thinking manager who says, right, from seven to half seven of a Tuesday, we're doing the mind gym. So that's the first thing I would do. Just like that like that you have good days bad days but as a whole you will create a baseline and um, three accept that you're not infallible and um, some days you're going to have bad days you're going to have bad weeks sometimes for some of you one or two of you or people that you know are going to get worse than a bad day and get help quickly don't wallow in it don't think you're weak it is not weakness get help if you see people who you think might be struggling ask them if they're struggling you're not going to put any mental or bad ideas into their heads by asking them have you thought about harming yourself or somebody else and this is something very important that I always try to ram home to young men in particular because nobody tells you this and people worry oh I can't ask him that he's a bit low if I ask him this I might just push him you don't push people to do bad things by asking them but you mightn't help them by not asking so if you notice it in anyone ask them they might only be dying for that person they are thankfully People who get those kind of feelings are a very, very small minority, but there's enough of them for us to worry about them. And mm -hmm. um, the rest of you, your responsibilities to yourself, look after yourself emotionally and physically, to look after your peers emotionally and physically. And that means, and it's hard to do, and um, it's very hard to do if you feel like a coach or a manager isn't helping people's minds. You, a lot of the time you can't just say, oh, look here, Joe, I don't like this. You can't do that a lot of the time, but try and find proactive ways or might be encouraging, you know, people to speak to sports psychologists or speak to counsellors or whatever and just know that like I said you're not infallible and there's you know that phrase sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me names can hurt you and the way people talk to you can hurt you and that means you know this now that means you have to be better in the way you interact with your teammates as well and the people in your circle and bit by bit if we all do this a rising tide lifts all ships so I just think sports psychology isn't a secret it's not magical thinking it's just being intentional about your thinking and five minutes a day, if you're not doing anything in psychology beforehand, five minutes a day is going to be amazing for you. That's, that's top class, that's top class advice. That's probably one of the best pieces um, of tonight, um, Maura, and or just, just a, a nice light one there to finish off on. Um, is there any good um, documentaries that you'd recommend um, the lads to watch in terms of motivation or, or in terms of sp sports psychology if, if they're not too big into the, to the reading? I, uh, it's funny, I'm sitting in my Michael Jordan here, chair here, you know, I just feel like I need a cigar and a brandy and say, you know, and I took that personally. <laughs> that's a good documentary to watch and then maybe tell yourself, that's not the way I want to be motivated. If you see people, you say, oh, he won everything, but is he happy? I don't know if he is. Um, and a lot of his former teammates just don't like the man. 
And I suppose you need to think about your own legacy and what it is you want to be when you grow up or how you want to be remembered. Do you want to be remembered as a winner who nobody liked or do you want to be remembered as the person who people liked and won things as well? So I think that's the way you should be looking at. I think you can learn a lot from it and it's really entertaining. Um, I think one of the best sports documentaries that you can ever watch and people would say, I would say this because I'm biased, um, is uh, A Year Till Sunday. The one from when Galway footballers won the All Ireland final in 1998, and um, it was magical for so many reasons. It was the first time I think it had been done really in Irish sporting history. It was real fly on the wall. You got to see what was going on, and you don't see any psychology in it. But what you do see is hard work, camaraderie, team sh- teammanship, people looking out for each other, people getting given out to when they did things wrong but nothing being held against people. It just created a great, strong team cohesiveness. And that's what you need. The big secret of sports psychology, and a lot of the work of sports psychologists do is kind of soft work in the background. People might ask, sure, what does she do? She's only standing there watching training. But what you're doing is I'm observing and I'm giving feedback to managers and ways to create that magical cohesiveness. It's hard to describe, but a year till Sunday shows you how it should be. So it's a good it's a good documentary, I think, to watch. I think it's still on YouTube. I watch it once a year to feel good about life and enjoy myself and go down memory lane. And I just think it's a really good one to watch because it doesn't describe sports psychology, but it shows you what a good team environment is. And if you have that, you're more than halfway there. And I'm trying to think, is there any other good ones? And there, I had a list of them before and bit by bit they went out of my head. The new documentary, the two part series by Tiger Woods, I think is very interesting again from a psychology point of view you can see the psychology of somebody who didn't have the best of starts in life you know his dad kind of messed with his head a lot and it's a good way to watch again and think i'm and we will all reach these crossroads in our lives when you're offered alcohol drugs infidelity things coming to you which might seem like fun but they mightn't be very good for you or people around you it's good to watch to see how easily you can go down that path and learn from it and learn that, you know, even from the worst starts in life, if you haven't got the best role model, you could still excel. And that's the great thing, I think, about the human spirit. It'll always come to the top, even if you are challenged at times. That's, that's great. But actually, I've been in those, um, those, those two um, more as well. Um, and I'd actually tell, I might, I'll probably send Oh, them. and one more thing I should say. Oh, go ahead. Here, um, the, 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 the film with Al Pacino, Any Given Sunday, and that speech at the end, um, waste of time don't force your team to watch that speech that speech is not going to work magic for you the amount of teams i've heard around the country and around the world being forced to watch that film you're not going to learn anything from it you'll just be entertained it's a good film it is not sports psychology <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't so i'm going to make it i made a note of those um those um those two um, documentaries more and i actually did a thing there on your instagram not so long ago um, I think it was every day, just small little snippets of um, sports psychology for people to reflect on. Um, so I might actually um, pass that yeah, on to that as well. Yeah, I did a 31 days of sport and exercise psychology just to try and make January a little bit shorter and then created a cross for myself because I had to do a post every night and come up with team photos or team things. But it's good little bite-sized bits because my aim is to demystify sports psychology. It shouldn't be for people who have lots of money. It can be expensive if you're going for that tailored one-on-one all the time. But I mean, not everybody has Tiger Woods' budget, you know what I mean? But like, I just think little snippets, the whole point is to help you feel a little bit better about yourself and to get the best out of yourself and that you enjoy life and you enjoy your sport. These are the best years of your life. You shouldn't be feeling terrible amounts of pressure. You should be feeling enough pressure to perform and get the best out of yourself and challenge yourself because you don't want life to be too easy. But uh, like, you know, you want a bit of crack as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've, we've one question there, um, more hopefully it's okay there from uh, one of our, um, sure. one of our, our football coaches um, Simon Gillespie um, he just asked he sort of touched on it but I think he's looking maybe a bit more from a, a coaching perspective how do you help players stop um, cast, oh my god um, messing up their shit and I suppose he's used a big word there that I can't quite get out at the minute um, I often find players that have already missed the <laughs> shop before they take it what can coaches do to develop shooting or new skills in players that they haven't performed um, in games before I love when you say the word shooting in a dairy accent. It just sounds very, <laughs> sounds like another word we'd say in the West. <laughs> it happens, it happens, it happens in America too. It happens in America too. It's a curse of the accent sometimes. No, Mickey, it was, it was catastrophizing. 
the word is catastrophizing. You, you know, you expect the worst. Catastrophizing. You can't mm-hmm. say it. Yeah, you, you expect the worst possible outcome from, you know, before you even take the shot. You'll have players that'll turn back. They won't even do it. You know, and they won't, you know, even training sessions, you have players that'll go out of their way to, to just not take the shot. Like, and then when it comes to the games, it's too late. So I'm just wondering, is there anything that you've seen coaches do to help players bring on their, their shooting? Yeah. Their shooting technique? It can be a challenge. Like I remember actually when I was applying for my accreditation with the Irish Sport Institute, I worked with a an athlete involved in athletics and it involved a set skill and he had to do it a certain way to continue his trajectory and to qualify for the Olympics. And unfortunately for him, he lost his nerve and he was regressing. And so it involved... Now, I'm not saying all those people who aren't taking the shot, for example, are at that level, but at that very extreme level, you nearly if it's that extreme that it's holding them back and therefore holding the team back, I think definitely engaging with a sports psychologist helps because I'll use this guy as an example. He t- it took me two or three one hour sessions of just talking to him to get his feeling of how he thinks that feeling came about. When did he first notice that feeling around, you know, that kind of thing. It took a long time to narrow it down. And then, we narrowed, then once we narrow it down, we had to work on strategies to get him to do the thing again build them up a bit so desensitization really is a good way to do it but I would be very careful um in how you go about that but absolutely I would make them do it at training if they're not doing it at training like you said there's no way they're going to do it in a match scenario so if you see people fading back from it I would be making sure I would implement it into your coaching I would make sure it's part of the training session everybody has to take two or three shots pre-performance routines are ideal for this um the first time people probably noticed pre-performance routines was through rugby. Like we thought, I don't know if you've all seen the Dan Bigger dance before he takes the kick, for example. If you guys haven't seen it, just check it on YouTube. Um, and that's an extreme version of a pre-performance routine, but it worked for him. He always got the kick in between the posts. But it's it's a, uh, I use it a lot for people doing set plays. So the penalty kicks, the free kicks in golf. I'm working with a few golfers at the moment and the pre-performance routine for them is invaluable. And this is where, again, people can figure it out by themselves a lot of the time. Sometimes people can't. Sometimes people need the, and what works for me might work for you. And again, that's where working with a sports site can help. But it's creating a little routine to do before you take each shot. And the reason you create that routine is creates mental peace, physical peace, lets you, so say if we're talking about golf, it get, lets you feel at one with your club. If it's to take that kick, say the free kick in Gaelic, and um, it gets you, gets you to that frame of mind that you trust yourself to take it, that your hands aren't shaking, that your body isn't shaking, that you've done it so many times before, that you know where the ball is going, going to be, where you know your foot is, has to be a certain point. And some people need to count in their heads three steps before I take the kick. That works for them. And what they need to be careful with then is don't deviate from it. Don't say, oh, this is a big game. I'm playing, you know, Sligo in the first round of the Connacht Championship. I always take three kicks, but this is a big game, so I'm going to take four sometimes people's minds can do that to them and they deviate from what they know is the right thing to do at the last minute. And then of course they make a bags of it. And before, and that will help with the catastrophizing because catastrophizing is I'm going to do this and I know I'm going to do it wrong. But with your pre-performance routine, you know, it's not going to go wrong because you've executed it appropriately hundreds, if not thousands of times before. So therefore the catastrophizing makes no sense. Whereas at the moment, if you haven't taken the shots, if you're not executing it at training, if you're not executing it at matches, the catastrophizing nearly makes sense because, you know, I haven't really done it before. I want to have it has it worked out well. So when you think about it in your mind, it makes complete sense to not go because chances are you will make a hangs of it. I don't know if that helps. Well, that's actually really, really good. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it encourages coaches to make sure that you pick players that, that you see doing that and make sure they do it multiple times in a game. Yeah, uh, more and times in training like, before, beforehand, yeah. Yeah, and I would also make players that you don't see doing it, but you think would be good at it. It's no harm challenging players. Um, challenge, challenge brings growth. Like anything we found easy from day one, where you know we tend not to progress, and things you find hard, uh, once you master it, a bit like I'm sure we probably all remember the first time we finally figured out how to cycle a bike without stabilizer. Is you're like, woohoo, I'm doing this. Um, but it took a long time to get to that point, but once you get to it, it becomes automatic. But absolutely, I wouldn't, as a coach, you're helping them by forcing them to do something they don't want to do. So long as it's challenging them and helping them grow 
and you're not it's not a not a massive leap you're not going from here to here right away you're bringing them from here to here to here to here that's what a good coach does you're challenging them and you're helping them grow like they're little seeds and you're making them your beautiful flowers <laughs> perfect more um sorry but not getting the word um and they're right just too much pressure right now to get that cut because i'm not gonna try it anymore um but i think that's all the questions that i think that's all the questions we we have um from from the lads there more um listen thank you very much for your for your time on it's you know it's it's half eight half eight with you within Ireland at the minute um in the morning but uh listen thank you very much we hope hopefully we'll see you over when uh Golly come over to to us in the next um kind of championship match um yeah they were supposed to be over the last time, actually, obviously COVID got rid of that. But the time before that, when Galway went over, myself and two friends actually said, you know what, we never do this. And we just decided we were going to go for the weekend. So we got to see the whole Gaelic Park experience and stuff on big match day. It was brilliant. Um, I, you know, it was just so much fun. And it was nice for me. I did a bit of work there that day. I did enough work basically to justify going. <laughs> 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 and um, we had the best weekend and it's it's it, it was a privilege to go and I actually a lot of the people and I didn't realize till I went over how important it was to New York you know I saw like for example Damien Coleman from Galway was over there as well doing hurling camps with the kids and stuff like that mm-hmm. and those connections with Ireland are really important and they're just important from a developmental point of view and I think it's good for us as well who are so immersed in GA in Ireland who appreciate why it's so important and sure look you guys are in charge now I mean you've got Larry McCarthy in there so <laughs> everything is going to be completely New York from here on in we uh we've, we've a lot of success in these in these development squads over the last um few years more so you know that the, there was good news there for the footballers with the junior championship last yesterday and we'd like to hopefully get something somewhere in the hurling over the next next few years but it starts with um these 17 18 19 20 year olds um, that we have now and, and you know every every bit of information it's a step in the right direction. So thank you very much for your for your time tonight. No worries. Thanks for having me, guys. And best of luck with the season whenever it starts. Perfect. Maura, last thank you very much. I'm gonna stop the recording here now.